He is currently not being used very much in shows. <coughs> the last time I saw him was on February 21st, and he was relatively active. They were training him. They do not touch him anymore. You saw in several scenes in the film that they were, of course, right up next to him on the slide out or near the deck, touching him, hugging him, petting him. They do not do that anymore. He has not been touched since February 25th, 2010. He is scratched with a broom, basically, on the end of a 10-foot pole, and it is sometimes massaged with a fire hose. And other than that, he is trained from behind a barrier. It juts out into the water at about 45 degrees so that he cannot come up over it towards the trainer who is standing behind it and has this 45 degree angle shield in front of him now. He is, as far as we know, still being used for breeding, which as a responsible breeding program would tell you is mildly insane. He is a known killer and you don't breed known killers. But he is still the most prolific breeder they have. They only have one other male that is known to have sired calves at SeaWorld and one male who has been used for artificial insemination in other facilities. So Tilikum is really the only option they have at the moment until this younger male starts producing more, more calves. I personally believe it's a mild miracle that he's still alive. He's about 34 years old. And to be brutally honest, I expect to hear of his death anytime. For the last four years, I've been expecting to hear about his death. So the fact that he's still alive is a testament to his genetic makeup and his will to live. But his life is very circumscribed now. It's very narrow. It's very little variety in his life right now. Just real quick, at, at the um, Shamu Stadium in Orlando, only two of the pools are deeper than he has long. So in the show pool and the, and the pool where he spends most of his time, those are the only two pools that he can actually really even hang vertical and not touch his glutes on the bottom. Um, also, I stopped referring to SeaWorld's program as a breeding program. I call it an inbreeding program. <laughs> So um, they, they can start, um, I can say usually around 18. Um, one of the people in the movie that you saw, Kelly Flaherty Clark, we were trying to figure out, she's my age, and I think she may have started around 18 or 19 years old. So it's not a requirement. Um, it was not back when I started, so again, this is 1990, but um, despite the fact that they do say it on their paperwork that they prefer someone with at least an undergrad degree, I've not seen that to be the case. Um, and then there's other facilities um, all over the world which have even less stringent standards. Um, a lot of places, what you can do is work at the park in an unrelated uh, sector of the park. You can work in food service, or you can work in the education department, or you can work in operations. And once people get to know you, um, you can try out for the position. It's, it's not really, what's required of you to be a SeaWorld trainer is that you have strong swimming skills, you have good presentation skills, you look good in your wetsuit, <laughs> and um, and you can you can take orders really well. I mean, it, it's not most people think that you need to be some kind of a marine biologist or an animal behaviorist. Um, I certainly assumed that that was the case, but um, it it really isn't the case. In terms of recruiting, it's a good question, um, and I think the recruiting is the shows themselves. Naomi and I were at um, Marineland Niagara Falls um, back in September, and I watched the the, um, the dolphin and seal and beluga show at Marineland. And despite the fact here I was sitting next to Naomi, he's a you know, whale biologist and I'm a former SeaWorld trainer and I know the truth about what goes on behind the scenes, I can still feel myself being pulled in like, wow, that would be a really cool job. <laughs> you know, that's what, it's by design. Um, they, get, they get kids interested not in being scientists or marine biologists or researchers, they get them thinking that this is the only way to get close to the whale. And I'm sure every day, you know, kids who visit SeaWorld go home and say, that's what I want to do. I want to be an animal trainer. Because they're not really educating the kids. 
you know, they're, 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 they're giving them some experience. And, um, and one thing that I always say is that, you know, personally it was my dream to swim with the killer whale, but clearly it wasn't the killer whale's dream to swim with me. I never thought about it. And they're not teaching that to the, to the kids that they recruit. They want people young, they want people who don't think, and then once they get into the system, after they've been there for a while, they're kind of, it's kind of like a cult. So they get indoctrinated into this way of doing things, and they're, not, they're discouraged from looking outside the company for any information. As a trainer there, um, anybody who was in the audience who was considered by SeaWorld to be an activist, um, even scientists were considered activists, we were discouraged to speak to them. Now, in the 90s, there was no internet, so I had no way to, I had to go to the library if I wanted to learn about killer whales. But now you think, with all the information that's out there on the internet, plus this movie, that trainers would just be leaving in droves. But in a way, um, just, just like in a cult, they, they are brainwashed to believe what the company tells them. And then, on top of everything else, if you were to speak out about your experience at the park, um, where, how would you ever get another job? There's very few jobs training killer whales and, and, and dolphins and sea lions around the world. So people are, very few people actually speak up after they leave a place, despite what they've seen. Um, I was only there three and a half years, and what I saw, I saw plenty of stuff while I was there, but there's people there who've got 15, 20, 30, 40 years in, and um, if they wanted to, they could totally sink the company, but they won't say anything, they're too afraid. Yeah, and in answer to that, my name's Dr. Ingrid Nisser, and I'm from New Zealand. I specialise in, in working with Wild Walker, and I've spent a number of years working with them in different places around the world. But I've also visited a number of aquariums and dolphinariums, and, and particularly um, the one in the Netherlands, Dolphinarium Harvey. And in that dolphin show, they actually have a young girl up on a trapeze, but she's got a little bed up above the domed area where the audience sits. And it's a dream that she has to swim with dolphins. And then the dream fairy comes along and she comes down this trapeze and she swims with dolphins. And so they're actually showing kids that if you dream about it, this is what you can do. And so that's how they're recruiting them because they're, they actually say to them, how many of you now want to be a dolphin trainer? And all these kids put their hands up and that's how they're getting them into the system. Most of the executives at SeaWorld came up through the ranks. And they were trainers first, and then curators, and finally executives. The executive vice president of animal training or whatever. Most of them started either straight out of high school, or they were in college, but they dropped out because they were working at SeaWorld and having such a good time in their minds that they didn't think finishing college was necessary. So several of the executives at SeaWorld, who run the company now, have no college experience, and have never worked anywhere else but SeaWorld. So if you're wondering why they're being so resistant to the information that is now very public, they, you can't put the, you know, the toothpaste back in the tube, as we say in the US, but they're resisting this with a great deal of force because several of the people who control the company now have never been anywhere else. This is their family and we are attacking their family. It's a very strange psychological situation. Oh, the management some said in another discussion that the less you question things, the more time you <coughs> the animals. So it's, it's, it's the same way the animals are trained, the same way the trainers are trained. Dad Lysinek, who was my former boss, who you saw in the movie, blaming Dawn for her own death, saying it was her, he pulled her in by her ponytail, it's as simple as that. He has a book called Whale Done, and, um, and he, I think it was written with Ken Blanchard, who's the same guy I wrote, who wrote my cheese? <laughs> it's, a, it's a business uh, training book, it's about training your employees to get them to do what you want, and he actually, he's got a, a he, he goes all over the world using the principles of animal training that he used at SeaWorld to, uh, to train employees of companies. To, uh, and I, I think it's hilarious, actually, but that's that's what he does. I mean, that's that's how indoctrinated they are into this way of life at SeaWorld that they believe that everybody should do things the way that they do it. Um, yeah, actually, I have two questions. You, you said that the components that the the brain should be set free again, and um, I was wondering whether it's possible for brain that have spent so much time in captivity to go back to life. And then I have another question. Since these are animals that are extremely emotionally intelligent, I was wondering whether the fact that now they don't even have the contact with the trainer would actually 
make their life worse and make them more frustrated than they were before. Thank you. I think that most of these whales cannot be returned to the wild. I think there are several that should be evaluated for that, and great care should be taken not to remove all opportunity from them, but generally, I think they've either been in captivity too long or they were born in captivity and have never known a natural life. And so they can't be returned to independence in the wild. However, I think all of them can be retired to sanctuaries or refuges that are much larger than the tanks they are in now, are in natural seawater, are more stimulating, more interesting, more challenging, and at least give them some choices rather than the schedule that is imposed on them by SeaWorld or Marine Mazanti or Boda Parque. And I also think that, um, your, in, in, for your second question, your second question was? No, I was just wondering, I mean, I'm not that uh, absolutely not that I'm in favor that the same thing we got. Right, the trainer's not interacting are, with them, right? If, if it's not worse than yeah. because all these barriers, because actually they need the right. emotionally, they are emotionally sensitive and they must need the contact. And I understood that with other ways it doesn't necessarily right. work because it's like putting a Russian and a Spanish and it doesn't make much sense. Well, basically, I think that it is dangerous for the trainers, and Sam can speak to this some more. It is dangerous for the trainers to interact with the animals. These are not dolphins. They are the largest dolphins, but they are not bottomless dolphins. They are not um, dogs. They are predators that are much, much larger than we are. It is dangerous to interact with them. And if the only way you can keep your employees <coughs> safe is to lessen the welfare of the animal because you are taking away a social interaction that they have come to expect, then you shouldn't have the animal in captivity in the first place. And so what I believe is if you retire them to a sanctuary or a refuge, that it would give them so much more stimulation that the loss to human direct contact would be mitigated. I also am not suggesting that people will never interact with these animals again. They are interacting with some of them. They're just doing it with what's called protected contact and it's used for elephants, it's used for tigers, and it should also be used for orcas. <coughs> uh, Sam has just suggested that I jump in here about uh, Morgan, the young orca that's being held in Goro Parque, and she's the main reason that I've come along this evening because uh, her plight is in, in many respects worse than what you're seeing here. Uh, she was an animal that was captured by the Netherlands and she has been transported to uh, Loro Parque in Spain where she has been brutalised by the animals there. Um, I've documented by photographs over 650 bite marks, ramings, um, attacks of all sorts and uh, she is so stressed by this that she's chewing on the concrete. She's lost the top third of her teeth and chewed her teeth right down to the gums. And unfortunately, the captivity industry says that she's in excellent health. And we believe there's been a violation of the CITES permits, not only for her capture, but also for her transport to Spain. And the aquarium industry says that Morgan can't be released. Now, legally, uh, we believe that the law is on her side. Legally, she um, should be, have been given the opportunity but um, the aquarium industry is using every dirty little trick that they can to try and keep her in there, including uh, <coughs> now trying to get her pregnant, because if she's pregnant, then um, the calf will be a hybrid, and also, you know, we can't transport her if she's pregnant, and what do we do with her with a calf that was born into captivity? And typically with orca in the wild, they learn from their mothers how to nurture and, and look after a child in a very similar way that we would. We have female members of our species teach us how to look after our kids. And if she hasn't been given that experience, it's going to be extremely difficult for her. So uh, we, we have a very, very strong rehab and release program in place for Morgan, and we want to give her that opportunity. But the industry doesn't want it to happen. So, you know, there, there's obviously two 
two sides of this and what we're saying and what they're saying. Um, to try to broaden the, the issue a bit, um, what would your response be to a person who just watched the movie and said, well, okay, I don't want to see any uh, orca jokes, I'll only go to Delphine area where they have dolphins to be a smaller animal, they may not get the same injuries, uh, they probably don't kill any people, um, they might be not as social or emotionally intelligent, and they might even have uh, stronger family bonds and captivity, what would be the best uh, response to that? I'm a killer whale biologist like Ingo. Um, I'm a killer whale biologist like Ingo. That's what I did my dissertation on, so I spent a lot of time with these animals. And I feel that based on the evidence, particularly the danger they pose to trainers, they are clearly, there is simply no question anymore that they do not belong in captivity, and it's time for the industry to wake up to that fact. And that's why we're here. That's why I'm working in the United States on a bill in Cal the state of California, and hopefully a federal bill soon. That does not mean that all other whales and dolphins are fine. It does not mean that. What it means is they are less critically uh, important at the moment because at least <coughs> hoping to the extent that they are not killing people and they are not killing each other. Orphans kill people and each other in captivity. So it's a, in my opinion, it's been an emergency for 20 years since I started working in this field. But it's definitely critical that we act now. Or somebody else is either going to get hurt or killed, or a whale is going to get hurt or killed. In fact, I'm waiting, as I told you, just every day to hear that sultans die. And so, it is not that bottlenose dolphins or belugas or pilot whales or false killer whales are not a problem. I just need to deal with this emergency right now, and I am continuing to work on the welfare and the disposition of all the other captive cetaceans in, in the world. I think I also have to do that. We are now discussing uh, the Bannon uh, Dolphin area not because uh, only the uh, can hurt trainers. <coughs> we asked for the Bannon Dolphin area because, uh, as I understand them, there are like torture chambers. And human uh, is not how we will treat any human, it's not how we want to treat this wild animal. On top of that, we see that if we don't respect uh, and if we don't act in the face of humanity and misfortune, this would have a problem also the trainers on us, on, on our side. Uh, so this is an added information, but it doesn't change the very fact that uh, these places are places of torture, places that uh, are deceiving the children and families and people that go and watch uh, the songs because they're using the intrinsic need to get close to this animal. Uh, to really mild, uh, to really uh, treat them very, very badly, and to just not make them uh, extra bad. A lot of them. But uh, that's for that reason. The dolphins that don't make it into the show also often end up in sort of petting pool environments, and, and I've seen and, and also heard plenty of stories about people throw things in the pool, even though there are signs that say not to throw things in the pool. Animals ingest things, people put stuff in their blowholes. They're subjected to just constant um, touching or interaction with people. And then the other thing, too, is the, the swim with programs are just equally as awful. Um, I think it's surprising that we haven't had a death yet, given all the interactions. Again, you know, there's, a, there's several videos that you can see online. Um, there's one video of a dolphin that's supposed to be jumping over a, a rope. There's people on either side of the rope, and the dolphin's supposed to just jump up and over the rope. And instead, it jumps up and goes sideways and slams into the person who's holding the rope. And so, I mean, that's not an accident. <laughs> Everything we know about those animals, I mean, that, that, that was an intentional move. So, I mean, and then once they, they can only be in those swim with programs until they reach a certain age when they get sexually mature, um, it starts to be very difficult and more dangerous to be around the animals. Um, both for the humans and for the other animals, so where do they go? It's really challenging. Yeah, the um, swim with the dolphin programs that are very positive therapy, where they take young children, typically, uh, who have mental or physical disabled <coughs> issues, and they spend time with the dolphins, and uh, the aquariums do this for a huge 
amounts of money. It can be anything up to a thousand dollars for just a couple of hours with the dolphins. And um, I've seen this program or, or programs like this in a number of different aquariums now. Dolphinarium Hardebake, again in the Netherlands, who captured more than they have one of these programs. They are using dolphins that have genital herpes. <coughs> and genital herpes is a zoonotic disease that can be transmitted to humans. Yet they are legally allowed to do this with children that perhaps have um, special needs. And I just think this is another example of how wrong this industry is that they're allowed to do this. There is very good science out there to show that it is more therapeutic for children to spend time with puppies and cats than it is to spend time with these dolphins. So we really need to stop this part of the industry as well. And, and yet the industry is sucking people in and saying that we're depriving children of the opportunity for therapy because of our desire to want to help these children. So again, and as you so easily so clearly pointed out, that you know it's easy for them to prey on what we desire and what we want. Um, with no regard for the animals at all. Last thing is, um, Laura, Dr. Laura Marino has written extensively about dolphin-assisted therapy, and she's, she's got a lot of the science. You can just Google her, on, um, and, and you'll find several of her articles on the internet. The latest thing that I saw for interaction programs that I just, just came out, probably that I was just aware of in the past six months, was now you can actually have dolphin-assisted birth. So uh, you can actually have a dolphin be your midwife. So I mean, to me, that's absolutely insane. You know, again, given the size of these animals, do you really want a dolphin in the water while you're giving birth to an infant? <laughs> and and this is and this is something that's offered to people. I, I personally think it's the most selfish thing on the planet. You know, <laughs> that it's a, it's incredibly um, it's exploiting the animal and you're potentially putting the baby at risk. So um, and people just consider that that's okay. Uh, you clearly speak out against. Um, World. Have you faced any challenges by them in trying to intimidate you and shut you up? I mean, this is certainly the case in other parts of the industry. For example, I can just recall the agribusiness industry and all the ag gag laws in the <coughs> U.S. And, and everything else that it's, uh, uh, you know, they're trying to do in order to not to expose um, actually animal abuse. Yeah, um, I've been doing this for over 20 years, and I started, the very first thing I ever did when I joined the animal protection movement in 1993 was we launched an anti-captivity campaign specifically on SeaWorld's doorstep. We went down to Florida and had a press conference. I came out of the academic world. I have a PhD in orthobiology, and so from the very beginning, I was able to hold my own in terms of responding to the absolute drivel that they that they put out, the, the absolute nonsense that they say. And I also know <laughs> a lot of people in the marine mammal science world well, and they're friends of mine, and they're actually protecting me. And it, was, it is very difficult for SeaWorld to threaten me in any way, not even my science, not even my credentials. And that was the easiest and most direct thing they could do that could harm me. In terms of threatening me, you know, and I, I got that question from a gentleman in Russia and wondered if I was afraid of SeaWorld. And they're delusional, but I don't think they're insane. And they know better than to even approach that sort of thing for, for outsiders. I think Sam can tell you some things that happen internally, and then Ingrid can tell you about things that non-SeaWorld parts are capable of. Yeah, my experience um, was that I, I very quickly became part of a group of, of four former SeaWorld trainers you see in the movie. It's me, uh, Carol Bay, Dr. John Jett, and Dr. Jeffrey Venturi. So Jeff is a physician, uh, John Jett is a university professor, Carol owns three speech therapy centers in Seattle, and I own an acupuncture center. So we're professionals and we've been out of the industry for 20 years. And although we all definitely, we all will talk about how terrified we were because that was just the, the, just the way the company rolls. We were all afraid at first to speak, but nothing has been directed specifically at us other than, you know, I lost some friends on Facebook and um, some people that I was friends with who are at SeaWorld have been negative. I can't imagine what's being said, what's said about us behind the scenes. More recently, um, SeaWorld, once, uh, once it was clear that the movie was getting some traction, 
the first thing they did was uh, in in June when it was when it was just about to get its theatrical release. They wrote a letter specifically about the film to about 50 film critics. They didn't really. All they mentioned about the trainers was that we didn't have enough experience to speak. That's kind of our MO. Um, and then specifically about me, there is the, the beginning part of the movie where I talk about my first time riding on a killer whale. And they use file footage from another woman who's riding on a killer whale. And I'm describing exactly the same thing. Um, the movie was vetted by lawyers, by fair use lawyers, by copyright lawyers. So there's not a lot in there that's not backed up by evidence. And so SeaWorld was kind of grasping at straws. And one of the things that they said was a lie is that I was talking about my experience of riding a killer whale, and they used file footage of another trainer. And they actually have that trainer, there's a two minute video of her talking about how hard she had to work to get to that point in her life, and how the movie makers took two years of her life away because they used her, um, because they used her footage as swimming with a killer whale, and that somehow makes the movie untrue. I kind of find that a little bit laughable. On the other hand, as Naomi said, they're not insane. I think they're, they understand PR, and that it wouldn't make sense really to attack us. Um, I personally didn't sign a non-disclosure agreement, although a couple of the other people in the film who more recently left did sign non-disclosures, and they may be at more risk. There are other facilities, as Naomi was pointing out, where the owners are a little bit more insane. And I'm thinking particularly of Marine Land in Canada. The reason we went there is because uh, John Holler, the owner of Marine Land, has sued several of his former employees for $1.5 million each, and also sued some, quote, activists for $1.5 million dollars each for speaking out against the company. One of them was uh, Kiska, the, one of the lone killer whales. She was Kiska's trainer for 12 years, and she has actual footage that she gave to the media of Kiska's tail fluke bleeding for, I believe, three months straight. So she even had evidence, and she was still sued. The other guy is Bill Demers. He was one of the walrus trainers there also for about 12 years. And, um, and he was sued. So I guess there's always that risk, but SeaWorld doesn't seem to roll that way. So, um, you know, I feel, and, and also as Naomi was saying, uh, I don't really see them even as a worthy, worthy opponent anymore. The evidence is so on our side, you know, and, and, and so anything that they throw at us, it's very easy to rebut, it's very easy to show the facts. And once people hear the facts, it's really clear that they're the ones who are, who are lying. And, that, and honestly, the final thing I would say about this is if SeaWorld stopped their animal performances tomorrow, I'd be like, go see world. I really, you know, I personally don't, I mean, I would, I would work with them. I would do whatever it is possible to stop them doing what they're doing, all the other marine parks and aquarium for that matter. I think the problem is not, SeaWorld as a company can have roller coasters, you know, they can be a theme park, they can do really good education. There's so many things they can do. So I would be completely behind them if they would just stop the animal exploitation part of their business. Yeah, and my experience has been a little bit different. Um, <laughs> I have had, uh, I was an expert witness for a court case about Norman, and 48 hours prior to appearing in court, I received a very, um, well, a, a witness intimidation letter saying that I had to withdraw my evidence, otherwise um, they would sue me for defamation, and they would basically take me to the cleaners. Uh, so I thought about it. I laughed at the time because I thought, well, this is, this is hilarious. But of course, you know, when you, when you reflect on that, you realize that they really can destroy your life. And one of the um, ex-trainers that's being dealt with with Marine Land at the moment, Phil Demers, um, he really has had 